this company, and I know I'm sorry, I have to put my glasses on to read this, but here we go. Um, Henry is the founder of Cascop Valuations, and he works with uh, small and mid-sized businesses and their owners providing business valuations. He also does more than just the business evaluation though, because he's got experience um, in succession and transition planning, mergers and acquisitions, estate and gift tax planning and reporting. Uh, so lots of things that can be very helpful to us as well as domestic relations lawyers. And what every couple needs to know if they're engaged in um, some sort of a business valuation, they have a business in their uh, family and they need to determine like what's the value. Is that something that you do then, Henry, for others? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the entirety of my practice is valuations, business valuations for uh, some sort of business ownership transition. So when you think of a transition and the concept of a family, you know, a divorce or a dispute, you have the family and either one or both spouses own the business and you need to determine how much that's worth when you're trying to determine how to separate the assets. But we can get into some more details in terms of what personal goodwill and how our fund state of Illinois makes things a little more complicated. Um, but also, sure. yeah, yeah. And um, but there's also valuations for general succession planning. So buying a business, selling a business, um, business owners who are gifting their business or parts of it to the next generation, to the kids, the grandkids to own. So anytime you have a business and there's some sort of ownership in motion is, is when I get brought in. Okay. And, and I know we've had some, some dealings with you in the past and it's so much easier when we can demonstrate for the court, you know, what is the business worth? Um, you made mention that there were some things that make it a little bit more difficult in Illinois. What, what are you talking about? Yeah, so Illinois, um, well, I guess the first part of evaluation, we could dive into this in a little bit, but you, know, you first determine how much is the business worth, okay? So what's 100% of the business worth? Then Illinois um, and other states do this as well. Uh, they want to know, the state wants to know how much of the value of the business is related to the individual versus the business enterprise, okay? So very simplistically, a business is worth X, you subtract out any you know, fixed assets, equipment, or, or tangible assets, so everything left over is what's called intangible. Then you break that intangible part into two pieces. How much of it is related to the individual versus how much of it is related to a business? So, so let me give you an example. Um, imagine you have a business uh, owner, he or she is a surgeon, and they do heart surgery with their hands. And they have a business that's heart surgeon LLC that the hire, hospital hires to do the surgeries. If something happens to that surgeon's hands and they you know, have a physical dis disability, the value of that surgery business is arguably zero because the entire value of the business is related to the skills and reputation of that surgeon. And so that case, you could argue that yes, there may be value here, but a lot of that value is related to the individual, um, not the business. And why that's important is in Illinois, personal goodwill is not considered a marital asset. So if that surgeon were to be getting, was in a divorce and you value the business, but you, you know, the argument can be made that all of the intangible value or most of it is related to the person. So that value is taken out of the marital estate and then everything else left over is, is separated. You could think of um, like a, the opposite end of the scale could be a, uh, like a telemarketing firm, right? Um, McDonald's. McDonald's, even better. Yep. You, you don't go to McDonald's because you love the franchisee owner of McDonald's. You go to McDonald's right. because of the brand. And so that's right. how, you know, it makes our lives a little uh, more interesting and, and uh, challenging is we have to value the business and then value the personal goodwill component that needs to be yeah. taken. I would imagine lawyers would have the same problem if, yeah. you know, we've only recently been able, you know, to sell our businesses. Um, but of course, if you were buying Anderson and Bobet without the Anderson, oh my God. Oh, the value. <laughs> Forget <laughs> it. <laughs> But, but that's true. I mean, there, there is something to be said, you know, about, you know, the, the enterprise, the reputation, um, not only right. the attorneys, but, but the practice, right? So you, you've probably witnessed, though, um, in your dealings where you have a spouse that will come in and say, well, the business, the business owner's spouse will say, the business is worth nothing without me. And they say, I do everything for the business. And so there's zero value. So you can't add that to the equation. They all think that, by the way. <laughs> Right. They do. I own a pizza place. Nobody would buy my pizza unless I was here. Like, <laughs> well, and then you ask, okay, well, is, it, is the pizza place named after you individually? No, it's called Corner Pizza. Right. Pizza Hut. Lou Malnati's. Pizza Hut. My favorite pizza place, Lou Malnati's. Well, Lou's not making the pizza. You got to sell the recipes. You don't care yeah. if he's there. You care if his recipes yeah. are there. 
Yeah, and there are franchises now of Lou Malnati's, even though that didn't used to be, at least as far as I know. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Malnati did well. Yeah, he sold his businesses uh, probably um, five, ten years ago. Um, yeah. It's Dick Portillo, even... hello. How many millions of dollars did that guy make? I think, I think it's a B, not, not an M, it's a billion. So. It's a B, yeah, right. Yeah. There we go. right. So it's what are you doing to value a business? Are you looking at sales? What are you looking at? Yeah, great question. So ultimately, it boils down very simply as a buyer or a business is worth its future profits. A buyer is going to come in and buy a business based on all the future profits that the business is going to generate. So there, there are three main approaches or that, that are used to value business. Um, and I'll touch on them real quick. So the first is the income approach, just like I mentioned. We can forecast the revenues and expenses and profits year over year over year for the business. And then you calculate all those future profits and you determine what is the present value of those profits in today's dollars, taking into account the risks of hitting those levels of revenues and profits. That's called the income approach. Um, the market approach is similar, but you look at companies in the same industry as that subject business and you see how much did those companies sell for and you calculate multiples. So was it a multiple of revenue, maybe a multiple of profit or some kind of earnings? Um, and you say, okay, well, if this business sold at five times an adjusted profit level and I'm a little bit better than this company and larger and more profitable, maybe I should be a six times profit. And so you look at the market and see what are the multiples. Uh, to determine how to value a business using the market data. Uh, and the third approach is the asset approach. Um, it's more used for like real estate holding companies or very companies that have a lot of assets. Um, we just take the value of the assets, you subtract out the liabilities and you get to a net equity value. Um, but those are the three ways, but ultimately it, gets, it boils down to what is the value of all the future profits that the business is going to generate. Right. Yeah. Easy. Um, <laughs> what about, I, I just had this problem come up and since, since I've got you on the line, I just have to ask it. Yeah. Um, value, if any, of a 501c3. Well, by definition, it's a, it's a nonprofit. So, I mean, right. there's, you know, um, now to say that some nonprofits have been improperly used uh, for nefarious purposes, the statutory assets, it probably wouldn't be the first company that does that. Um, that'd be a really unique situation and be really difficult to argue. Um, now, you know, like for example, I think the Red Cross is a nonprofit and they do billions in revenues and expenses, but they all, it's not like there's a profit generating to, to, the, to the entities all reinvested back in. So it'd be an interesting argument to, to make that there's, you know, the value in there, but you, you never know, you know. I'm gonna be calling you on that one because I have, <laughs> it's hot right now, you know, and I have, to, I have to argue that one. And so I'm arguing kind of the same thing, you know, it's a not-for-profit, there's no value, but. I don't know. I mean, you know, that, that's a tough one. And, and the question is, is the value to whom, right? So even if there is a value, is it the value then owned by the, not the purpose of the nonprofit? So if it's for education or healthcare, like, okay, well, there, it's worth this. So, but, it, but it's all going to this source. Or, or does it go back to the people that set up the nonprofit? That, that's another question you ask is who owns that value, right? Right. Yeah. Unique I would one. think you'd have to look at what they get paid right? Like the, that, how could it be worth any more than you could take out of it? That's one thing. And actually in evaluation, you know, they mentioned that Jessica, the, one of the main adjustments that I, I and any appraiser make in evaluation are, are to get the expenses to normalized levels. And what I mean by that is, is business owners are all over the spectrum on whether they pay themselves a very large salary and have zero profit in the business or pay themselves very little salary and show a lot of profit in the business or somewhere in between. Um, and when you look at evaluation, one of the biggest adjustments that I make is, you know, if, if I were to replace that owner, what is the market salary for that owner? Because ultimately I want to adjust for wherever they fall on that spectrum to get to market levels of salary and market levels of rent. Um, cause again, if you own the building, you could pay yourselves a lot of rent to your rent company, or you could pay yourself nothing cause you own the building. So to you, it's right pocket, left pocket, doesn't matter. Uh, but from a valuation point of view, it matters because you want to get just the business value isolated. So that's a very important point. In that example you just gave where some people want to have um, lots of income or no income, why, why would one business owner choose one or the other? Yeah, it's sometimes it's a, it's a tax question. I mean, business owners traditionally don't like, well, like nobody really likes paying taxes, but business owners don't like paying taxes. And so if you pay yourself a, a salary, yeah, uh, there's an election about this topic. <laughs> Well, moving on to politics, um, <laughs> business owners 
you know, if you pay yourself a W-2 mm -hmm. salary, you have to pay payroll taxes and Medicare, Social Security, all those taxes, right? So business owners can get aggressive in, in by pay themselves a very low salary because then they report a high profit on a business. And if their business is a pass-through entity, like an S-corporation, it still goes to their tax return. It just goes to a different box, but sure. there's slightly less taxes paid uh, to go one way or the other. So it's usually a personal preference. I mean, I have business owners that pay themselves <clears throat> extremely large salary and they don't mind paying the payroll tax, but they know that that's their salary. It goes in their checking account. They're not messing with business profits. It's just, you know, cause they may have other owners and it gets complicated. So um, it's just a ta personal decision and sometimes a tax motivated decision. Okay. If you knew somebody was going to go through a divorce and they have a business that's going to need to be evaluated within the next year or so, is there any like, uh, what am I trying to think of? Um, any kind of advice you would give somebody to, to, to make sure that that evaluation is as high as it can be? Well, yeah, that's, that's the tricky one because when you think of, you know, because I get this from clients all the time in terms of, oh, we really want a really high value or really low value, right? And sure. uh, I understand that that's their goal. <laughs> Sometimes the attorneys acting as advocates on behalf of the client are pushing for, for certain levels. Uh, from my perspective, and sometimes I'm the bad guy in the situation, but I'm saying, what is fair market value? And, and fair market value is defined as willing buyer, willing seller. What is the price that they would agree on if everybody knows all the facts about the business? And so it just, you know, I'm going to come in wherever the data says, and that's, that's just kind of it. Now, in terms of planning for a business, or if you're in a situation where you might think there's a divorce looming and you just want to know what the business is worth, um, there are ways to get an appraisal that's not kind of the full blown appraisal that, that you may be familiar with. So it's maybe something like a limited appraisal might make sense for the client. So um, it, if you think of a valuation report, it's typically, you know, 50 to hundred pages. It's got a write up of all the analyses and data performed and everything considered. And here's the unequivocal, unambiguous opinion of value that I'm going to testify to a judge about. But if you just want a number, uh, to plan just to get an estimate of what the business is worth either if you're thinking about a divorce and you're like right, how much is this thing going to be worth or if you're thinking about selling it or some kind of a transition a limited appraisal might make sense to start you get an estimate of value you get you don't pay me or any other appraiser to, to write that report you just get a number a range of values and you could do your planning and, and if down the road you need a full appraisal um, you could always bump that limited up to a full uh, and get that um, get that you know report. Um, but, but in terms of a planning tool, I think the limited appraisal, it's somewhat of an underutilized service, but I, I find that lots of clients really enjoy that, um, that feature, that, that service. So when it's limited as opposed to like a full scope appraisal, do you look at less data? Do you look at just like a snapshot in time or how does that work? It's, I imagine, imagine it's not going as deep into the analysis. So I still have to look at the financials under either right. full or limited. I still have to do adjustments. Now under limited, maybe I don't dive as deep into some of the hard analysis on all the adjustments. I'll still make the adjustments that are appropriate, but maybe not as of a refined search. Um, so that's one limitation. The other is the, the research on industry multiples, on discount rates, on just the data. I still need to get the data that is necessary to form a realistic estimate, um, but it might not be as deep of a dive into that. And so, you know, you get, you get a, as was with anything, if you have clients that pay you to do 10 hours of work or 100 hours of work, there's a lot of more that you can do for, with the extra time. Um, and then obviously the biggest savings is you're not paying me to write a, a 50 page report. That, that's a big savings of the time on the limited sure. appraisal. Yeah. What about people who own a business and they don't take a salary and you don't really know what they're earning? Do you ever do like valuations or, you know, reports on what someone's earnings are? Yeah, that's, that's like a, that's more of like a financial analysis, not traditionally a, a business valuation, but it's like a, an earnings analysis. And, and one way you could address that is if they're working at a business, but not taking a salary is, I can research what is a market salary for this person in this position with this level of experience, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something that, you know, if they're taking zero salary, but they're taking profit from a business, so they're just altruistic and not doing anything, but they can generate a salary. You can research market salary rates from various sources and get a good estimate of what that is. Um, there are people that do, you know, there's even life, I'm sure you've seen a lifestyle analysis where they look at all the expenses and, you know, earnings that, that individuals get or spend. Um, to get an estimate of kind of for, for a legal aspect, but from a valuation standpoint or from a market salary standpoint, you can get an estimate of what the market 
and th this is the, my favorite question to ask a business owner, right? Whether they're paying themselves zero or a million dollars in salary. Right. So if you were to leave <laughs> tomorrow and you were to hire someone to do the exact same thing that you do, can do and you can find this person, how much would you pay them? Would you pay them less or, or more? Oh, I'd pay them so much less, so much less. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah. I'll make that adjustment. Yeah, it's, it's except hard. for the small business owner who says he's making sixteen thousand a year. I'm like, my God, you can go to Starbucks and be a barista for more than that, you know? Yeah. Right. And that's the other half is is the expenses the business owners run through the business, right? Sure. So oftentimes they have they may have their car and all the gas as a business expense, and whether or not they use the car for business or not. If it's a hundred percent business, that's fine. But if there's some personal use put through the business, it's just an adjustment that needs to be made. You know, I've seen, gosh, I've seen everything. I've seen golf club memberships, airplanes, boats, racing, like dirt bike companies. I've seen deadbeat kids in college making six-figure salaries. You know, Jessica, we need a boat. Don't you think a firm boat? <laughs> I need someone to make me their deadbeat kid. <laughs> like, yeah. What? Yeah, one of my favorite clients. Me up. <laughs> one of my favorite clients I worked with was actually in a in a divorce setting. It was one of my favorite clients. The favorite, the facts were fascinating, where they had mom and dad start a business, but they were butting heads, and and the three kids were in in their third thirties, and one just graduated college. They were running the business, um, and they were each making a very large salary from the company. Um, they did very well as a manufacturing company. Um, and the youngest daughter graduated with a marketing degree and she handled all the social media for this, you know, plastics and, you know, buckets and pans company. So she handled social media for that. And her salary fresh out of college was $250,000. Nice. <laughs> and, and the two other siblings, both were the, uh, were engineers and they ran the machine. They were taking, you know, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars And so, wow. <laughs> I mean, they were doing well and, and you know, but for the family issues, everyone would be very happy financially. But what was funny is, you know, the, the kids, the parents are having their issues. It's the whole family drama, as you, as you I'm sure, know, go through. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the kids pulled me aside and say, Henry, you know, you see businesses all the time. If you see a, a business in the manufacturing space, um, let us know. We might be interested in buying, you know, just to get us away from this family stuff. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll keep an eye out. But I want to let you know. Um, that the profits that you guys make at this company and the salary that you guys take is a lot higher than what is in the marketplace. And they all looked at me, especially the 24 year old looked at me like, <laughs> like, what do you mean? What, what? do you mean? <laughs> right. What? There's all of these types of situations out yeah. there. It was, uh, but it's but at least that would be the party's children, which wouldn't be so objectionable. Um, I get the one where usually it's the guy, sorry. Um, employs the girlfriend for mm -hmm. way more than she could ever make, you know, like, so she's like, I don't know, pick a, pick a job. Um, a, the assistant to the regional somebody who would normally be paid like $30,000, but she's making 150. Right. You know? yeah. And so yeah. we have to argue that like, in what sense would that ever, you know, occur? We get a lot of that, but yeah, that's, and that's, in the, you know, from a value of a business, that's pretty easy to calculate. And even when you're adjusting, you know, excess compensation, yeah, we, you know, I've seen spouses and actually it was the guy in this case too, where he took his three best friends to Louis Vuitton's and, and spas yeah. and trips to Paris and they were all for business. It's necessary. <laughs> Jessica, are you listening and making notes? Uh, yeah. So then when Jan gets back, we can tell Green her shopping? what we've decided. <laughs> Listen, so we got a, a European trip, we got some uh, purses, and we talked about a yacht. Right? I, I know. Branded. I'm, as long I'm as making branded. notes. I am making notes. <laughs> it's we an do advertising expense. Here. We'll put right. a billboard on it. Yeah, just go up and down the lake. Just, just sail back and forth. There you go. We can put our name on it. It'll be. Um, we do have a question here for you, Henry. Yes. Um, if you have that business person that takes no salary, but then is getting maintenance, because ex-spouse has a paying job. Um, I have to wrap my head around this. When there is a change in circumstances, ex-spouse loses the job. How is this viewed by the courts? Maybe, I'm not sure if even this question may be geared towards you or maybe Jessica. Yeah, maybe towards towards one of you, but I'll, I'll just speak. From, <laughs> yeah, from a valuation standpoint, I mean, I, I kind of see, you know, they, they're trying to play games in terms of where, do they take W-2, do they not take yeah. W-2 salary? You know, so from a market standpoint, I mean, you could 
back up with data how much this person should be making, you know, but, but from, I think that's more of like a legalese question. Um, yeah, as soon as I read it, I was thinking the same thing. Maybe this is for Jessica instead of for you. Okay, Jessica, jump in. <laughs> Well, it sounds like, so someone's running a business, they're not getting any money, but they're getting maintenance because the other person has a job. I don't think it matters what the business person is doing in this situation. If you lose your job and you're paying maintenance, it's a change in circumstances that the court would entertain. I don't know why the person running the business that takes no salary is getting money. I don't know like what the court determined to allow that or if the parties agreed to it it's really fact specific but generally speaking if someone loses a job and they're paying maintenance yeah file a motion to modify right right away because you can only get the retroactive back to yeah. the date and file and then you know you got to see what happens yeah and we have had people crazily enough who have actually quit their job to avoid the payment of maintenance so right how and why the maintenance um, or how and why the person loses the job can sometimes be important. So we would issue a subpoena to the company, see if uh, it was a, somebody quit or, you know, they came to drunk, came to work drunk and caused their own firing. Um, so how they lose their job sometimes can be important. Um, some judges really, frankly, don't care how they lost their job. It's just they've lost their job. Um, I once had a guy go to prison um, and I argued against the modification of the payment because I said he did it to himself. I mean, like, you don't just like, it's not something that randomly happens to you that you have to go to jail. Um, but the judge still said he was going to modify. And I was like shocked by that, you know, like, wow, because yeah. yeah. he did it to himself, you know. But and you probably take this into consideration when you guys are doing um, your settlements for maintenance is even if that situation where someone's taking zero salary, but maybe they're getting a lot of profit. On, uh, from their business on their K-1s or the Schedule Cs. Right. I mean, it, like I mentioned, it's either it's going to your right pocket or it's going to your left pocket. It's, it's coming to you one They're way or the other. Yeah, yeah so, so you really have to look at both sides of the equation. And, and you know, Jessica's right. If they kind of agree to it using this formula, that's one thing. But if they're playing shell games and trying to be cute, you know, you may want to look at the total economic picture of that individual. Yeah. I swear we would have no work whatsoever, Henry, if people would just be like, honest about things it's like one side is always trying to take advantage i don't it's like god you spend more of your time you know trying to prove the other side is not being quite quite honest yeah it's um, a, it, it is unfortunate because yeah it just it takes up everyone's time it costs the clients a lot more and you know but you kind of yeah, have yeah. to go down the road if one of the parties wants to pull everything through the mud you, you're kind of stuck yeah. So if we were to hire you and there's already been in a business evaluation, um, and I guess it would be, you know, from our perspective then, um, what would be kind of one of the first things you would look at to see if it was done right or if you could poke a hole in it, I guess? Yeah, there, there's a lot of time where I'm, I'm retained to do a rebuttal report of the other appraisal or just, you know, you have my appraisal <laughs> to someone else's appraiser and you appraisal and, and the judge decides what, which one is which uh, is more correct. You know, besides looking at the, the mathematics, make sure that the numbers are calculated correctly, the, the biggest underlying factors um, where, where appraisals typically um, uh, don't jive is the underlying assumptions. So you'll have one side saying, look at the business, it's growing like crazy, it's got these amazing opportunities, you know, it's going to be worth a lot. And you have the other side saying, yeah, there's all these risks, things are, we're projecting it's going to go downhill, you know, we might not hit these numbers. And it's the data that's given to the appraisers then especially if there's financial data that can go to each side, well, then you're going to have really skewed numbers. And then, you know, as I mentioned earlier, my job is, is not to, to, you know, get the best number for the client. My job is to get what is the fair market value of this interest. Here, here's what it's worth. And this is what yeah. an unbiased person, because, um, that, you know, that, that's my role. Uh, and some clients, they, most clients completely understand that. Um, and, and, you know, me coming in from that way, I can then spot if the other appraiser, uh, other appraisal is a little more aggressive or pessimistic, and you can kind of see there's certain levers in terms of the valuation multiples used. Are they being too harsh on the business or too aggressive relative to the data? You know, and, and you know, parts of it is art, parts of it is is science, and so that that's just kind of where the the big differences come up. Yeah, I have a question. How about like this coronavirus? Um, it's like knocking a lot of businesses out. So essentially, you know, your competition is being kicked to the curb. In a lot of cases, um, are you seeing any one industry where 
that's affecting the evaluation because you know there's just not as much competition amongst that particular industry yeah um th i've seen it both ways one where the business value has really significantly decreased because if you're in a travel industry i have a couple clients in the travel industry and yeah they're they're struggling and the value because remember i said the value is based on future profits right future profits are lower and much more uncertain so that that's a negative but i've also worked with clients that are um in the chemicals and cleaning supplies space and you could imagine what has happened to those companies almost overnight right. Uh, and they're, they're booming. And, but, but to those companies, the biggest question that needs to be answered is, is this change temporary or permanent? Once COVID goes away in, okay, whoever knows, but maybe in a year, in two years, is this level of revenue that you've hit sustainable or are people going to stop buying masks and hand sanitizers and cleaning supplies? Or have we kind of plateaued up and now we are much more a society aware of cleaning supplies and personal health that it's going to stay at a higher level. That's the challenge and, and really modeling that out is, is important because you have, I have several business owners that are in their fifties and sixties and their business has changed overnight and they're saying, you know what, I'm ready to sell. You know, I don't want to do another economic downturn and recovery. You know, this is it. And so, but their business is going, going, and then it took a step up. And so the question is convincing a buyer that this is a permanent change. And, and that's where, um, yeah. The, the other trick <clears throat> is we as appraisers are very data driven. So we look back at other transactions to say, well, th these companies sold for this. So you're going to be worth that. The problem in, in the second quarter <laughs> and the third quarter is businesses stopped selling. The entire economy pretty much shut down. So mm -hmm. there's this like data gap that we have as appraisers, like they're, they're kind of missing. And that's the kind of the, the time period where we want the data to see how much they're worth. Right. It's kind of not there. So it's making our jobs a little bit more difficult, um, but it's still, you know, it's still possible in businesses. For my clients, anecdotally, there's some, there's deal happening. People are buying and selling companies, which is a good little sign for the economy. But, um, you know, and, and, but that's just, that's kind of the reality that we live in. And, and I'm sure that you are seeing, um, clients' decisions being impacted by divorce. I mean, whether it's just the, the timing, the strategy, uh, you're probably changing how you guys are approaching sure. it. Yeah. I totally wished I'd bought a toilet paper business though. Yeah, right. yep, yep, yep. Now the, the best one I had was a, a company that distributed supplies. They didn't make anything they distributed. They bought it from one place and they sold it to another. And yeah. they, they two and a half times in two months revenue like that. I mean, we're not wow. talking a small company getting a little bit bigger. We're talking about a big company getting a lot bigger. And yeah. just, like Amazon must have done crazily well. Uh, yeah, um, if you look at their stock price and you look at their volumes, it's 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 incredible what they've done. Yeah. With, well. I only account for like half of that. So <laughs> <laughs> Jessica single-handedly keeps them in business. <laughs> There's a counter in their app where you can see how many packages have been delivered to you. In really? I didn't know about that. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my have God. a drink when you open it. I recommend. I'm going to do that. That is incredible. Well, both <laughs> drink and look at the counter. That, that's great. Right. <laughs> they'll, they'll tell you how many times they've been to your house. Wow. That's funny. When they know you by name, the driver knows you by name. It's always a problem. <laughs> no, that's, that's true. I, I, I've talked to um, business sales consultants who work with sales teams to get them to, to understand their customers and sell more. And one of the questions that one of, the, one of these individuals asks is, do you know your customers as well as Amazon knows you? Right. Because Amazon will, will throw you suggestions and pop in and go, oh yeah, sure, buy it, you know? Um, and you need to know yeah. your customers just as well as Amazon knows you, which it's scary. Right. <laughs> yeah. Totally. So Henry, what's like the most fun case you've ever worked on? Or bizarre case, I love bizarre cases. <laughs> oh, gosh, bizarre, I mean, there, there's a couple of bizarre. I worked on a, um, a marina, luxury boat marina in, in the Caribbean. And I demand, I wanted a site visit really badly. I really okay, needed right. to get out there. You have to see it yourself. No, client, client did not. I, I did um, <clears throat> value a, a chocolate, a candy factory, like Willy Wonka, like legit. Oh that man. Amazing. You're walking through that and seeing the big- If bag. you ever get a call for that, you need to bring me with. Deal. Deal. You know, maybe quality assurance is something that needs to be Oh yeah, they would, I mean, they were these like jawbreakers. They would just hand those out to, to uh, people doing the tour again. This was pre-COVID where people could walk around and, you know, yeah. breathe in the air. Um, were you uh, done the candy? Yeah, that was, that was interesting um, one. But no, there was, uh, 
I mean, there, there's so many fascinating businesses out there. And I'm sure, you know, people, your clients, you, they tell you about ways that they make money and you just blows your head away just how, how amazingly successful people can be. Um, and then your traditional companies that just make a good solid living and they own their jobs and it's, and it's, it's so that's a big, that's the most interesting part of my job is I get to see all these little unique industries and, and, uh, right. yeah. and you're like, God, I wish I thought of that. I say that all the time, all the time. It's like, wait, you make how much doing what? <laughs> I need that business. Yeah. It's like House Hunters International. I make stamps. Our budget is $2.5 million. Like, yeah. what? It's insane. Yeah. What's a business during at least your lifetime, Henry, that was a good business at one time that's just as not anymore? The, the first one that comes to mind is, is the printing business. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, business I mean, cards, yeah. Business cards, mailers. Um, yeah. You know, I actually uh, worked with a company that sold all of the Bears season ticket booklets, like the actual tickets. You know, it was yeah. a huge multi million dollar account each year for that company. Wow. And then the Bears went online. It's all wireless, it's all in the app. So that completely, you know, and so and you think about it, these printing machines, they're not like a big printer you see like at a Kinko's or FedEx or whatever. I mean, these right. things are long. It's like 200 feet long and they just spit out thousands of cards and they cost like half a million dollars a piece to, to buy and assemble. Wow. Um, so, I mean, these are very heavy asset businesses that are, um, you know, that, that are, are struggling. And there's still value. People are still doing printing, but not, not how much it was before. And, and the flip side of that, I mean, you have anything, you know, tech space, financial technologies, you know, apps that, that do you know, budgeting and you see some of these that they go from the unicorn companies that go from a couple employees up to a couple billion dollars in value. Um, the, the, the val those are the companies that are the highest multiples, the highest growth that I've seen in the last you know, 10 years um, kind of pop up out of nowhere. Yeah. yeah. Even the Bitcoin companies, I valued a Bitcoin mining company. And if you want to have your head hurt, trying to understand how cryptocurrency <laughs> mining works. I know. Right. <laughs> I mean, I've spoken to a couple of people and I'm just like, God, I feel like kind of dumb here because it's just like, you're, they're explaining it to you and you're just like, oh, the what? more you learn, the more confused you become. Yeah. Because you're like, I get this right. piece. What about all this? And then you just keep learning. Yeah. It's a fascinating business model. And, and I liked working with that client a lot, but it, again, it was just, didn't exist five years ago. Totally. Right. Yeah. I always yeah. wonder what's going to come out of this pandemic that didn't exist prior and like last long term. I'm trying to get ahead of it. Cause then if I invent it, maybe. <laughs> Well, you, you're had dead struck dead right because there have been multiple studies and, and articles and papers written how during the 0809 crash right after that a lot of people obviously lost their jobs but it was one of the most booming periods for new startups and entrepreneurship because people got creative by necessity and yet all these companies that have that started right after the pandemic or the uh, the, uh, the the great recession and so people are saying right now you know we're going to look back at this time and see a lot of people kind of similar a startup for new things and to answer what it what it is i don't know yeah well like frankly that. i had never been on a zoom anything until this started you know yeah and now it's just like wow you know you how do court. you're doing court hearings via zoom we're now. doing court on zoom yeah i've done trials on zoom um and, and frankly i enjoyed it you know there's yeah. there's not that traveling into the city um it's craziness you know? yeah. for a thousand pieces of paper yeah, right. and you you know for for domestic relation cases we have both parties they don't have to be in the same room they can yeah in the room, and that's that's another kind of intangible aspect of the dynamics yeah I'm sure you see yeah yeah and being able to like chat with them on the chat feature mm -hmm. and talk to them that's good it's either passing notes back and forth but yeah right. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll look back five, ten years from now. Oh, yeah, I remember. You know, I Zoom think we should have you come mind. back next year and tell us. Like, <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah, we'll we won't be able to. We'll just have glasses. We're like one eye is you, the other side, and it's just each walking around, and it's <laughs> right. Yeah, all the crazy technology things. I love that. Um, I love watching those kind of things and see what's coming out. But there's value. You bring it back. There, there's value in a lot of things. And if someone's willing to pay you for it and buy it, then that's what the market is. And that's, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun thing. You know, intangible assets, valuing patents and brands. It's always, you know, what is it worth to someone? And there's a market for it. And we can determine the value. There's right. a market for everything. Oh. Just like there's a person for everyone. 
go. Sometimes there more than go. one. Sometimes yeah, there. in a, in our case, yeah, hopefully more than one. <laughs> Sometimes a lot more than one. Uh, uh, well, I don't have any more questions. Did you want to say anything, Henry, about how people could reach you or? Yeah, it's, you know, I was very creative with the name of my business. It's a cast off evaluations, um, dot com. Uh, I'm sure you can find the, the contact info, but uh, anytime you have a question in terms of how a business is valued, what's right, you know, I'm, I'm available to chat, uh, and, uh, hope give to people the you. number, your phone number where they can reach sure. you. It's uh, eight, four, seven, six, three, seven, zero, five, one, one. And my email is very simple as well. It's Henry at Kaskov valuations. Look at that, how easy that is. Well, I will definitely follow up with you on that 501 501C corporation problem I have. Um, so. Very good. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for giving me an excuse to wear a button up in, in a sports jacket in today's world. This was great. Thanks for great. joining us. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for coming aboard, Henry. And um, I'm not sure if we're doing a talk Tuesday next week, but. Um, we will see you soon. Thanks awesome. so much. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Okay, bye-bye.